Thank you. Yay. Hey, that's all right, Herb. So um, as you'll quickly learn, I love tools and apps and all this kind of stuff um, to the point my team kind of hates it because I change things quite often. Uh, but we're going to dig into a whole bunch of these. So um, we take kind of questions as we go and see where we are. But I'm going to try to cover a lot of specific apps we use, why we like them, ones we don't use, and why we don't like them, but why you may still like them, all that kind of stuff. Um, as was mentioned a minute ago, I work with Green Melon Media. Um, you've heard about that already. Ashley and Brooke are back there. Some of you know Allie, who didn't make it this weekend. Chantel was here yesterday. Um, and then All Things WordPress Meetup up there. Go to allthingswordpress.com. It redirects to a more appropriate URL because you're not supposed to use WordPress in it, but it makes it easy to, uh, to find us. And we have, we have a Slack team for that and all kinds of stuff. Um, so check out our Meetup there. Um, yeah, so to get started, yeah, again, I have a lot of slides. I'll go pretty quick, so please, please stop me if I glaze over something too fast. Um, but before we really dig in, I want to sort of tell you where I'm coming from in this stuff and how I approach these tools and why I choose some over others. Um, a few pieces that are different to me than maybe different to you. Uh, so to start on the left, uh, we always aim for inbox zero. We're big believers in that. Uh, we get tons of email. We keep tons of email. But between my two inboxes, I looked, I have 375,000 emails in them from the decade and none in the inbox. So we're all about keeping the inbox clean so we know what's going on. Um, and then secondly, we love the Verizon hotspot. We always look to be online. There's lots of great tools to work offline and local development and all that. That's not how we work. We want to be online and make sure we're online and spend the money to make sure we're online. Um, these tools reflect that. A lot of these are, most of these are useless if you don't have a connection. Um, I don't like Verizon. They're a pain, they're expensive, they're rude, but they have by far the best coverage, so I'm not going to butt off my nose despite my face. Um, and then next, all these tools, to the extent possible, are platform agnostic. You know, I'm a Windows guy, I have Android, Ashley's on iPhone and Mac, and so I want tools that work across all these things. Um, as a result, most are web based. I'm a big Chromebook fan. We have two, Chrome, actually three Chromebooks in our house for the kids, a Chromebox for the computer, and you know, I want stuff that'll just work across whatever we throw at it. There are a few exceptions we'll get to, but most of these should work on anything. Um, and so as a result of that, most Apple apps are out. Not that I'm against them per se, but iMessage and some of those just don't work with other people, so they don't work with us. Uh, the other thing that sort of influences this list is the book Getting Things Done. Show of hands if you've read this. Yeah, good crowd. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a great book. I mean, it's decades old. They re-released it, but it's very conceptual on how to, how to get things done. And I'm a firm believer that Green Melon Media would not exist without it. Uh, when I started the company, I was working full-time at a church. Um, I also had some blogs I was running on the side, and I was trying to start a company, and I really had to have my crap together to make it happen. Um, and this book really helps with that. His main philosophy, for those of you that haven't read it, is to have a mind like water, kind of a, a zen thing. But the thought is, you should react the way a still pond rea reacts to a stone thrown in it. If it's a small pebble, it reacts a little bit. If it's a big rock, it reacts a lot. And we all know people that freak out about everything because they don't know where things are. So have your stuff together, know where things are, and then you can react appropriately. Sometimes you do need to freak out, but sometimes you don't. And so this way, if you know where everything is, you can react as you need to react. Uh, we could do a whole topic just on that, but great book. If you haven't read it, I would check it out. Uh, I've tried to break up the various tools into eight logical sections. A lot of these kind of overlap, but I've sort of broken it down the best I can. Uh, the slides are already in our Slack channel for the group, groups you can find them there. Um, so again, if I go too fast, you'll find that. And a lot of the slides, I have a link at the bottom to find out more about that or a link to a blog post we wrote about or just something where you can get more information. And again, all those are on the slides. You can grab them whenever you need. So uh, let's dig in. <laughs> Section number one, email and tasks. I've kind of broken this section with a few of those things. Uh, Google Apps, how many of you guys use Google Apps for your email? M large majority. Wholeheartedly recommend it. Um, that or maybe Zoho or Office 365, they're all good ones, but I mean, for $5 per account per month, I mean, it's nothing. Just use that. You can make it very easy to get things taken care of in there, plus the slides. I'm running this through Google Slides. Um, it's been nice. I have my slide decks, which I'm not a designer, so I can say, hey, Ashley, go log in and make my slides look better, and she can. Um, it's very nice to have all that stuff shared, and again, I jump from computer to computer. It all just works. Uh, we'll talk about some of the other specific Google stuff in a little bit. Um, to hit inbox zero again a little bit, I think Google, Google Apps helps make that more possible. Um, Merlin Mann, are you familiar with Merlin Mann? He did a lot of inbox zero kind of stuff five or ten years ago. Uh, based on his Twitter, he's kind of crazy now, but <laughs> he had some good videos back in the day. And I've got those listed on the GMM.2 Get Inbox Zero. It's a post I wrote a few years ago that has some of those videos on it. Um, a few things Google does in particular I like. Uh, there's a feature in there called Send in Archive. Simple little button in Google Apps. Not a big deal, but instead of sending an email, going back to your inbox, selecting it, and archiving it, it takes you five seconds, but 
Five seconds at 100 emails a day is 50 hours a year from one little stupid button. And they have a lot of little stupid buttons like that that can save um, a lot of time. Other ways I like this to help me keep my inbox cleaned out is a um, feature I call auto-resurrection. I don't know what they call it, but it's really just the way things work where it keeps conversations together. Um, Allie can send me an email say, hey, load this PDF on the site. And I don't know what she's talking about, so I reply and say, what site? And archive it, keep it out of my mind. And when she replies back and says, oh, put it on Megan's site, oh, great. The first email has also come back with the thread, so it's all there for me. I don't need to keep track of it separately. I can archive it, get out of my mind, if I trust that she'll get back to me. Now, if you don't trust someone to get back to you, you need to keep track elsewhere. But for people you trust, it makes it easy. And then the beautiful search in Google Apps. I don't worry about folders and labels and all that stuff too much, because in theory, now according to Merlin Mann, you should be creating dead husks of your email. There's something in there you want to get out of it, an appointment you need to put on your calendar, a file to put on a site. Deal with it, kill the email. Archive it just in case, but in theory, you shouldn't be going back and rummaging through stuff. So if you do, they have a great search. So if you spend, again, five or 10 seconds trying to figure out where to file an email, times 100 emails a day, it becomes ridiculous. Um, Ashley's been using Google Inbox more. I've kind of gone back and forth. Um, it's sort of Google's other way to get into your Gmail. It's worth checking out. I've gone back to Gmail for now, but it's got some neat things to make your workflow even better. So some cool stuff in there if you use Google. And again, Zoho has their great mail. Office has theirs. But you know, that's the way we like to go there. Um, for tasks, uh, we used Teamwork.com for a while. Um, you can see we switched from Asana to Teamwork. So we have a link there with our blog post, GMM.2 Asana Teamwork. Uh, we switched to them early last year. Um, that post talks about why. Ultimately, we kind of switched back. Their interface got a little clunky for us. Uh, but a few months ago, their CEO saw my post and ass assured me that they're going to be cleaning up their interface soon. That was two months ago, so I don't know what that means. But <laughs> hopefully soon. Um, they'll get that taken care of. But if you're not familiar with Teamwork, it's a lot like Basecamp, but better. Basecamp has some big holes in it that I just never could get past. You can't do recurring tasks. You can't do some elementary things that are just silly to me. Um, so if you like Basecamp, I think you would love Teamwork. It's worth checking out. Um, while we were on Teamwork, uh, they have a product called Teamwork Desk, which is beautiful. Um, similar to Zendesk and Freshdesk and some of the help desk kind of things. Uh, what I like about it, though, is clients don't realize we use it for the most part. They can just email us at a special address, and it goes into Teamwork Desk, and we can deal with it, reply back in there, and they just get an email back. So clients just email us and see emails back, but on our end, we can track how many times they've emailed us. We can direct things to other people. Um, a lot of you know we had Susanna, who's around somewhere. I don't know if she's in here. Um, but all of our Teamwork Desk stuff was going to her, and she left for a great new opportunity, so I just turned the faucet and pointed to me. And now we have Brooke, and now we're going to slowly turn and point it to her instead. Clients don't know or care. They can continue to email us, get things taken care of. It's beautiful, and it's essentially free. You get, I think, 150 tickets a month for free, and then it's like five cents a ticket after that or something. So it's beautiful. It works out very well. Um, and again, yeah, we just set up a special email address for everyone. So like Kathy Druin, you know, our organizer, she loves sweet tea. So if she was a client of ours, I'd say, all right, email sweet tea at Green Melon Media if you need us to do something. If she does that, it flows in here, goes directly to Brooke or whoever, and we can deal with it internally. Kathy doesn't need to log in anything or do anything silly. She can just email us like she likes to, and it's great. So even though we left Teamwork, we stuck with Teamwork Desk. We researched other options, saying, hey, we're not with them. Let's find a better solution. Haven't found one. This is better than, for what we need, better than Zendesk, better than Freshdesk, all those. And again, it's essentially free, so it's awesome. Um, so Asana, which we had used before Teamwork, and then eventually worked our way back to Asana again um, last October. So this is where we keep all our tasks, all the stuff we need to do every day. We spend a ton of time in here. Uh, the catch with Asana for us is everything is temporary. This is not a filing storage solution for us either. We'll talk about those. This is just for stuff we need to do, get it done, get it out of there, move on with our life. I mean, stuff's in there for months at a time. We get a new project, we drop in all their tasks, you know, for the coming months. It's not quick, but this is, again, not a place to go back and look at stuff we stored up. Uh, they had a huge upgrade last fall. I, I mentioned a lot of that in the, the post there, GMM.2, back to Asana. Uh, there's like a half hour introduction video that is phenomenal, shows you all the great ways it works, how to make it work for your team. The big thing for us um, was it was so much easier to add a task. In teamwork, if you wanted to add a task, it had to be in a task list. Before it could be in a task list, it had to be in a project. Before you had a project, it had to be in a client. So once you had it going, it was good. But if you want to add a quick task, it was kind of a pain. And so with Asana, you can just add a task. Boom. If you want to put it in a project, you can. You want to assign it to someone, you can. But you can just drop stuff in quick. You can paste a, a notepad file of 10 lines, and poof, they become 10 tasks. It's easy just to get stuff in, get stuff out, get on with your life. Uh, the one catch with Asana that we don't like, I was talking this morning with some folks, they don't have start dates. With Teamwork, you can have a start date and an end date. So stuff will bubble up when you need to start, and you'll still know when it's due. Asana only has due dates. 
Um, the way we worked around that is we make, a lot of our stuff doesn't have due dates per se. It's, you know, we got something, let's get it done as soon as we can. There's not a date specific. So we use the due dates as start dates, saying, all right, here's where we can start on. If there is a hard due date, we put it in the name of the task. So upload that PDF March 22nd. We know there's a hard date on that for whatever reason. But most of them just do it when you can. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, did they have reporting structure and ankle coaches and continuity to a degree, yes. Not, not great. I think teamwork is better on that. Teamwork has Gantt charts, and you can do a lot of deeper reporting. With this, you can go back. It'll show you for any project. It'll show you the number of, it'll have like a bar chart showing the number of tasks open versus completed. And you can always go back and see the completed tasks, but it is a little tricky to see how many tasks did so and so complete between this date and that day. You can do searches and count it, but not great for that. So, yeah, teamwork is much more powerful. I think part of the problem was we weren't using that power for us, but again, depending on your situation, teamwork may be a much better solution. So, um, others in this realm would be like OmniFocus and Basecamp and Trello. I, I know a lot of folks use Trello. It'd be that kind of thing, it'd be deciding between those. Um, so there's our tasks. Uh, files and notes. So again, we don't store stuff in Asana, we store stuff in other places. And our big challenge last year was trying to get it all in one place. You know, we had drop, do, Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets in Google Drive. We had notes in Evernote. We had hundreds of gigs worth of stuff in Dropbox. And it was tough because we want to look for one client. We say, well, we have some stuff in Evernote, some notes, and we have their documents here, but then all their assets are over here, and it was kind of silly. Um, it's all in Google Drive, and we'll talk about that in a minute, how we made that work. Um, ultimately, though, what I like about those is just I don't keep anything stored local. I, jump, I use this computer from time to time. I have a big desktop at work. I have a separate desktop at home. I want stuff to just be wherever I am. Storing it local is just silly. And if a computer crashes, I don't care. I mean, it's not good, but I get a new one and hook stuff up, and it's all there. There's, you, know, you can use Carbonite in some of those, which isn't a bad idea, but it becomes a pain to get stuff back. With this, it's just all there. It works out well. Um, I do use dual-factor authentication to make them super secure, because that is the risk, is getting hacked. But uh, it works out well. So I always like to ask, you know, think about that. If your computer right now just is done, it just catches on fire, you know, like how screwed are you? <laughs> um, hopefully not too bad, but uh, there's that. So Dropbox, again, we had everything in Dropbox, and we can't escape Dropbox. A lot of clients still use it, and that's fine. So we still have pieces in there. Uh, we mostly moved to Google Drive. So we were trying to find a way to have all our real-time notes, like in Google Drive, and all our files in one place. Um, and Dropbox has a new thing called Paper, which is their real-time editing thing both two big flaws. It doesn't have a spreadsheet component or a presentation component yet, and it's separate. We have, here's all our paper notes for this client, and here's all our files for this client. Instead of being in one folder, they're still in two places, which is silly. I'm sure they'll fix that eventually, but, so that kind of ruled out Dropbox for being the, the end-all, be-all solution. Uh, we looked at box.com, which is really more powerful than I thought. I hadn't looked at it a lot until last year, and it really does well. They have a feature called box notes, which are their real-time document editing, but again, no spreadsheets. Uh, they do put it in with your files, which is what we wanted. Uh, the big problem with that, mostly for Allie's situation, she likes to do a lot of things through Finder on her Mac. And Google Drive, puts, if, even if it's an online document, it creates a little file on your computer so you can see it in there and click on it and it opens in the browser. Box doesn't. They say, this is an online document. It doesn't show up on your computer at all. And for her, that's kind of a bummer. She's in there. There's no document. You have to go online to see it. Um, and again, no spreadsheets kind of made it a killer. Uh, so Google Drive is where we ended up. We poured everything into there. Uh, again, some clients have Dropbox, and we're, we're fine with that. You know, we'll use what we can. Uh, even with most of our Evernote over, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, one thing we love about Drive I didn't even realize is with Dropbox, if I share 100 gigs with one of you, we both have to pay for the space to cover that. With Drive, only the owner has to pay for it. So I moved everything over. I moved 350 gigs over, so I pay a bunch for space. The rest of my team doesn't count against them. They have all those files. They can access them. doesn't count against their storage caps. Now, it's cheap, and he has 10 bucks or whatever. It's not a big deal, but it's kind of nice. The one catch with Drive that we had to work through and almost made us keep looking for a solution that probably doesn't exist is you can't selectively sync subfolders. So in Drive and Dropbox, you can go in, again, we have hundreds of gigs in there. We can't, this laptop is great, but it's a small, small SSD and I can't put everything on it. With Dropbox, you can go into a subfolder and say, sync this folder, not that one, yes, this one. With Drive, it's the root folder, yes or no, for the whole thing. Um, and so for us, we had a folder called Green Melon with all our stuff in it. That doesn't work. Um, so what we ended up doing is creating like eight root folders uh, for different things. So that way you can selectively sync different ones in there. Kind of awkward, but once we have it set up and then we have to share it eight times and stuff, it's set. It, it worked pretty well. So we have like our active clients, our archive clients, our leads, um, design resources, tech resources, our stuff, just you know, a handful of folders for what we need. I pretty much need our stuff and our tech resources. Allie's more in the leads and active stuff for all her InDesign files. 
So we can sync individually the pieces we need, but still get all of it on the web, uh, and it works well. And then inside of a client, just an example of kind of how we put things together, we have folders for files, like the contract has some InDesign files, some PDFs, and just stuff you'd find in Dropbox. Uh, Inspiration is just a bunch of JPEGs. Meetings is a bunch of the Google Doc, like live docs, we can all get in there and share them together. Photos is more JPEGs, and then some more loose documents at the bottom that are more the real-time Google Docs. So it's all in one place, whether it's a virtual document or a JPEG or whatever, all in one folder, and it's beautiful. Um, it works out pretty well. And again, it's almost, almost free. It's you know, 10 bucks a month for me, I think, and that's about it. So it works really well. Uh, another one, Google Keep. Anyone use Google Keep? A few, few hands. This kind of goes the whole opposite direction. This is for super quick notes, more just for yourself. Um, Apple's iNotes, or whatever they call it, is essentially the same thing, and in that case it works, because again, this is just for me, so as an Android Windows guy it works. It does work on Apple stuff, but um, if you're just using it for yourself and you have a MacBook and an I iPhone and stuff, that works fine too. Uh, but I love it just for quick notes, just a quick, oh, I need to pick this thing from the store, or grocery lists, or don't forget to add that other piece. It's just a way to add quick notes. I can add it via voice from the computer. Again, it syncs all around. Uh, Keep.google.com is the site for that. Uh, totally free and again works on any platform, but really we, you know, it has sharing, but we don't share stuff in there too much. We have other ways for that. And then it's kind of handy. It syncs to my watch, which is kind of neat. So there was a shopping list. Um, it actually was kind of convenient because instead of having two hands on the phone, I could keep pushing the card or holding the bag and check things off. You know, more fun than useful, but it was kind of fun. So why not? Um, and my wife, you know, we share our shopping list, so she could add things to it while I was there, and it would show up. You know, so kind of fun. I like like Google stuff. Um, Evernote is next, which we don't use nearly as much anymore. Uh, if you heard me ever talk in the last five years, I've loved Evernote. It's been great, but it's been great. So see you later. <laughs> um, a couple reasons. One, they're kind of falling apart. I, mean, I don't know if you follow tech news, but their upper staff is going in and out, and they're kind of in chaos. Uh, it's slow to sync compared to anything else. You know, Google Keep is essentially real time. Google Docs is real time. They sync every 15 minutes or whatever, and it takes a few minutes. It's not a big deal, but they're not going to fix that anytime soon. It's going to be years. Uh, but really, the problem for us now is there's no place for it. We have all our stuff in Google Drive. I have my super quick notes in Keep. Why do I need a third place in between? So it's not necessarily bad. I mean, they're not going out of business anytime soon, but it just doesn't have a place in our lives anymore. So, you know, it's been, it's been great. You know, I still, have, I still have a couple hundred notes in there I need to someday go and move elsewhere, um, but it's just, just not anymore. So uh, it's kind of sad, but no more, no more Evernote. Um, one we looked at that was really surprisingly solid was Microsoft's OneNote and OneDrive. OneNote being their Evernote quick note thing and OneDrive being their Dropbox kind of competitor. Uh, it's a Microsoft product, so Allie and the other girls are like, oh, well, we don't want that. But it's actually awesome on Macs from what I've heard. Their, their Mac app has thousands of reviews, all five stars. They say it's phenomenal on Mac. So the platform agnostic piece works pretty well there. Um, didn't quite, it's not quite real time. It's kind of like Google Docs was before Google Wave came along and made it awesome where you can type. And every minute or so, you'll see it catch up with the other person. So it works, but if we want to be, I love Google Docs real time, where I can be typing, and Ellie's up here, and we can bold stuff, and other people can jump in. It doesn't quite do that. Um, so that's kind of what killed it for us. The one piece I do use, though, is they have Office Lens. It's a mobile app for scanning stuff. Really a great mobile scanner. You throw a business card at it, and it'll automatically crop to the right size and stuff. And, if you know Diana Nichols, she has a card with her text like written sideways on it. It looks cute, and every other scanner just blows up on that, and it, it can read it and still interpret what her text is, and does a good job. So I scan stuff through there and keep it, and then later process it and add them to LinkedIn or put it in other systems. We'll talk about later. So uh, it's worth checking out at least. But again, didn't didn't quite have a permanent home other than the scanner for us. Uh, physical files, I won't get into too much. There's different ways to do that, but uh, Merlin Mann, we talked about earlier, has some great stuff, a great philosophy called 43 folders. So you can read GMM.2, 43 of my folders, uh, where basically you have 43 folders in a drawer, um, 12, one for each month, and 31, one for each day of the month. And it's great for wedding invitations and birthday invitations and um, concert tickets and all the stuff like you're going to put somewhere safe so you don't lose it, and then like, where'd I put it where I wasn't going to lose it? Um, it all just goes in there. Um, I won't get too much into how it works, but it's really kind of nice just for anything you have. There's already a place for it, and every month, the month folder comes up. You open it up, put it in the specific days, put that month at the back. Everything just lives there. Um, again, this talk's not really about physical folders per se, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is time consuming. So, yeah, with all these, with Asana and teamwork and all these, it is time consuming to move stuff around. I kind of enjoy doing that, so that helps a little bit. 
And it's also like I've heard a good principal to school will move their teachers every few years because it makes them clean out all the junk in the closet. And it works well for this too. You know, when we move from teamwork, say, oh yeah, there was this project with these two tasks that they never responded to on. Let's maybe get back in touch with them. Or, oh, this guy actually was in three separate folders, so now we can get into that. It gives us a chance to clean up, but it is a pain. So yeah, that's worth. <laughs> Fast internet helps when you're moving 300 gigs worth of stuff in one shot too. Um, but yeah, good question there. So you have 43 folders. If you need a solution for that, most of you probably have physical folder stuff taken care of, so I don't want to spend too long there. Uh, communication. So a lot of our communication we've already covered. We talked about email. We use email a ton. We can't escape that. And Asana has great conversation stuff, comments. Again, if you watch the videos for Asana, it's neat. You can have conversations for a project at, in, at large, and inside of a conversation, you create a task right there that filters through, and it does neat stuff. But beyond those, there's certainly other communication we use, and two big ones for us. Uh, one is Slack. Um, you guys are hopefully a little more familiar with Slack now because of this weekend. If you want my slides, you have to go there to get them. I can give them to you other ways too. But, um, <laughs> but I, it's one of those things I'd heard about for a year or so. Everyone was talking about it. I didn't get it. I didn't understand why we'd want that. We're a team of five. We're in the same office. Why do we want that? But I read enough folks that said, You'll, it'll change your life. So, all right, I'll try it. <laughs> and so I convinced everyone we have to try this. And we, about, after about two weeks, it clicked, and we can't go back. Um, I guess the short way to explain it with Slack for those of you who don't know what it is, it's basically a chat room kind of thing in a way. Uh, except you can add uh, images and links and other things. Uh, but Slack, the free version, after 10,000 messages, it starts pruning off some of the old ones unless you pay for it. We're a team of five. We blow, blew through 10,000 a long time ago. I mean, we use it a ton. Um, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah? Are your slides on the green melon or what are your slides on? In, in Slack, there's a channel for every talk. So you can go in, and I, I'll post it on Twitter. We'll have it on WordPress TV. There'll be a number of places later we can get them, so yeah. Um, Slack, I heard a couple weeks ago, someone said Slack is vapor, and I thought that was a good way to handle it. Again, it's not a place to store things and keep them long term. It's just for conversations, kind of water cooler stuff. Don't count on it always being there, but it's just a, a great water cooler is the way to put it. Um, and so for ours, I won't go through all the channels, but just again for the five of us, we have 20 different channels. We talk about Asana, we talk stuff about our clients that we don't have a place in Asana for if it's maybe a new client or something. We have a general channel where, the, you know, Susanna was doing some coloring books and stuff, but they're all hot. Um, we think like a channel for lunch. So we can say, hey, who's bringing their lunch tomorrow? Are we going out? Because that was a problem. We'd come in and two people would bring their lunch and two thought we were going out. And so, you know, it's, it's important, you know. Um, and things like recipes, I'm not in there, but they love recipes. You know, Susanna, as you know, left us a few weeks ago for a new job and we took her out of Slack and she's already sad. She's lost the recipes channel from the other girl. So. <laughs> That's part of the perks of staying with us, so that's how it goes. <laughs> she lost out. So just, yeah, lots of things like that. I think I don't even have the new one on there. We have a new one called Home or Office, because we're in the office most days, but we'll work from home once or twice a week, and we've had a few situations where not everyone quite got the message <laughs> and would show up and be by themselves. We have a channel just for that, like, hey, we all coming in tomorrow? Cool, yeah. Um, so it's just nice just for all that real-time water cooler stuff. They have, again, a web app, a Windows app, a Mac app, an Android app, an iPhone app, just anywhere you want to be, it connects and works great. Uh, the other communication we use a lot is Google Hangouts. Um, really, the first four years of Green Melon, we were virtual, and this was our office. Allie and I would spend hours a day in Hangouts just working on stuff together from our separate houses. Uh, we still use it a lot just for quick messages in the office. It does get a little confusing. You know, do I put this on Slack, or is it a message in Asana, or is it a Hangout, or is it an email? I mean, <laughs> I'll admit things get a little hairy there, so we're trying to keep it pared down a bit. But it is great, because we keep it up most of the day and say, hey, Ashley, come here for a second. She can wander over instead of me having to yell down the hall, you know. It's kind of nice. For those of you who haven't used Hangouts, it's kind of iMessage and FaceTime combined. You can do quick messages with each other or do a chat or do a big group video chat, lots of things all at once, um, where it's better than iMessage, again, as it works on Windows or Mac or iPhone or Android or anything you want. Uh, it's wonderful for that. Let's see, moving on next here, education and reading. So one of our core values we have is education in three different ways. One is for our clients. We like to train them and you know, teach them what's going on. One is for others, like here and in our meetup and that sort of thing. And for ourselves. Uh, this is for ourselves. This is how tools we use to keep ourselves educated on top of things. Um, big one is Feedly. Any of you guys use Feedly? Only a few, wow. Um, so Google maybe made a good decision. So years ago, years ago, Years ago, three years ago, maybe Google killed Google Reader, which is a way to pull in blog feeds all in one place. And I still miss that because Reader was great, and I don't know why they did that. Feedly is essentially the same thing. You find blogs you like and pull them all into one place, and every new post just shows up in one little feed there instead of you having to go visit all the separate sites to see what's going on with them. Uh, I have 534 blogs that feed into mine, so I have a ton in there. I don't recommend that because you have to. You have to commit to it to do that many. But it's blogs about WordPress and blogs about SEO and our clients, what they're writing, and 
My kids' teachers have blogs. I get those in there. And they all just kind of come in one place. I'm sure of those 534, a third of them are probably dead. You know, don't post them. It doesn't matter. I don't have to go see if they're dead or not. If they have a post, it comes through. If they don't, it doesn't. Um, it's beautiful. So um, I use Feedly quite a lot. Again, they have a, a web app, good mobile apps for the devices. You can start. I don't read a lot in it. It's more I kind of flip through and save things for later and then kind of go back when I have time and read the posts I want to read and share them and do that kind of thing. Uh, but it'd be a good time saver instead of having to go check out different sites all the time. Just let them all come to you. Yeah. Correct. RSS feeds feed into Feedly, which, yeah, RSS never caught on quite like myself and a lot of others thought it would. And based on the number of hands that use Feedly, it's probably accurate. Um, but it is kind of handy. It is a good way if you follow a lot of blogs, they'll send them come to you. You can have them come to your inbox instead and filter through a folder. I mean, there's different ways to do it, but I, I like this, so it works well for me. Um, a lot of them end up in Pocket. Anybody use Pocket? <laughs> okay, there you go. A few more hands. So it's kind of a place to save things you want to check out later. It um, does a, a few neat things to help with that. One, it gets things out of your inbox, out of your Feedly, you know, save them here to read later. Um, but also, it cleans them up a lot. Blog posts, for the most part, once they're in pocket, it gets rid of all the junk around the side and gives you the post in the middle, which is kind of nice. Um, makes it just easier reading. You can keep all your stuff in there. So in theory, I'll read stuff in Feedly, star it, you know, try to read it and say, ah, oh, this is a long one. I'll throw it in pocket for later to keep Feedly free. And then pocket ends up, that's where it's full of stuff that I haven't gotten to ever. So. Um, but when I'm bored some days, I'll, I'll pop in there a little bit. Lots of videos and just any, any single web page, whether it's a blog post or a page, you can keep in there to, to check out later and see what's going on. And then the other one I thought I'd mention is Kindle. I'm sure a lot of you use Kindles to read on stuff. Uh, the one thing I thought was neat, I discovered a few years ago, you can see all the things you've highlighted on the web. You can go to, I think it's, yeah, go to kindle.amazon.com and log in. And so where this is neat, if you're reading a book and highlight things, you know, especially like if it's a tech book or something you want to execute from, you can highlight as you're going through reading and later come back and see all the things you highlight. Okay, now I'm going to go do what he said here and do what he said here and try this thing out here and, and go back through and see those things. And you can see popular highlights from other people and it's kind of neat to see that stuff later. So now when I'm reading a Kindle, even though I don't get here often, I'll still try to highlight things I want to look at because I know it'll bubble back up later when I get around to it. Um, so yeah, kindle.amazon.com for that. Uh, social media, any questions? With that section over. I know I'm going real fast here, but... <laughs> we're, we're getting there. We're halfway through, maybe. Uh, social media, I'll keep short because there are a zillion tools for social media, and that deserves a whole talk in and of itself. But I'll show you two that we use fairly often that a lot of you probably do. One, Hootsuite. Hands for Hootsuite. Yeah, good number of people use Hootsuite. Great way to schedule posts and read posts and keep up with stuff. Um, for those that haven't used it, you can just kind of have different columns of stuff feed in. Here's this Twitter account here, and here's this other Twitter account here, and here's my Facebook page here, and you can do different things coming in. And then schedule posts to go out. Um, I use TweetDeck from time to time, too. They're kind of scaling that back more and more. It's a kind of a cleaner interface for that. Um, I don't have a slide for it because it's not that important. Um, but the other one we use, mostly I use, is Buffer, which is kind of nice. That's where you can set up times during the day. I have like four blocks set up during the day of here's when I want to share stuff. And anything I throw in here fills in the next spot. So if I'm in a Feedly binge going through reading, oh, I want to share this. People love that. Oh, and this one, too. I won't tweet out six things all at once. It'll spread them out over time. And so I have it set up. I can set it up. I have the paid version for six bucks a month or something. You can add multiple accounts to it. So I have my Twitter, Green Melon's Twitter, Green Melon's Facebook, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, Green Melon's Google Plus, and Green Melon's LinkedIn. So I can say this article is appropriate for, this is more a personal one, let's send it to my Twitter and Facebook. It's like a business one, maybe to the Facebook group, and you know, you can choose where to send things out from there. Tom? Does it work the difference between this and Hootsuite? This is just easier just to toss stuff in quick and have it scheduled out automatically. Hootsuite, you gotta, I think you can do more of it now in Hootsuite, but this is just simpler, especially on my phone. I can just hit the button for it and say, yeah, put this out to those four, go, without having to log in and schedule a time for it. You pre-schedule. I have my four blocks or whatever, five blocks, you know, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., whatever they are. They're always set, you know, forever. And whatever I throw in, it just fills the next available slot. So Hootsuite's more for schedule this to go out tomorrow morning, more carefully planned thing. This is dump a bunch of stuff in it, but then spread it out so it doesn't just overpower, <laughs> um, which is kind of cool. I, I typically post more just manually. I prefer to be a little more authentic and post when I can, but sometimes I'll have a bunch of stuff and I can toss it in there and it's kind of nice. And how do you change your, you said from your feed link to Buffer? Is there a um, or you just kind of copy your link? And you can, well, I'm not sure on iPhone how it works, but in, in Feedly there's a share button, so I can hit share and I say, I'm going to share it to Buffer, and Buffer pops up over my screen, I can do it there. Mm -hmm. Or you can go and paste it in, yeah. Gotcha. Yep. I mean, you can do that to follow along a lot of that kind of stuff, but it just does it automatically, and so you can do that. I feel like every six months, I update the. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Good thought. I hadn't thought about that in a while. 
Um, and I think Hootsuite does similar. You can say, Hootsuite, schedule this out at the best time you think it should be today. And it'll pick based on similar kind of patterns what's going on. So yeah, good, good point. Um, next section, development. And again, I don't want to get too far in here because there's a lot of other talks that dig way into development. Um, I don't want to, but that's part of what we do. So I thought I'd share some of the tools we use there. Uh, the first one is kind of a big standout, FileZilla. Um, in that, it's the one that doesn't work on Chromebooks and that sort of thing. It's a Windows and Mac application you have to download. Um, it's just for FTP, so if any of you have ever had to FTP files, you likely use FileZilla. It's the most popular one out there. Um, the neat thing about it is they have a mobile, or a, what do they call it, a pocket version, a USB version. It used to be hot to have application that could run off a USB stick and put it in a computer. So I said, okay, if you can run off that, I can put it in Dropbox, it'll run out of there, and then I can just run it from any computer and have the same version of FileZilla with all my clients already in it, instead of having to keep up with five different versions, and oh, I don't have this guy added to it yet. It's all off of one. Um, and even with the Mac version and the Windows version, you can, it's complicated to set up. Once you have it, you can say, hey, on the Mac version, look for the list of clients in Dropbox here. And so that way we all stay synced up. You know, if Ashley adds someone to FileZilla that we have, the next time I pull it up, they're in mine too, and I can connect to them, instead of us having to keep track of, you need to add them, and I need to add them. And, um, so you can learn more about FileZilla at FileZilla-project.org. Uh, do be careful installing it. It's a very well-known, reputable program, but the installer likes to add toolbars and stuff that they shouldn't be doing at this point. But uh, so be careful installing it. But it is a great program. Um, you're saying that you can't do it in USB and just yeah. uh, run it from that? Yeah. Right, that, well, it's a separate version you download. But yeah, you can have it run off that. But again, I took the USB version and put it in Dropbox and then just dragged a link to my desktops, all my, all my different desktops, so they all run the same version. And then again, if I add any client to it on any computer, they're all saving it in the same place and they sync around and stuff. So it works well. Uh, one, for those of you who are here Friday, we talked about a little bit is Code Anywhere, um, codeanywhere.com. For those of you that, you know, it's an IDE, it's meant for editing code on a site. So if you don't do that, then don't worry about that. Uh, but it's a web based code editor, basically. Uh, the advantage there is you go and it'll edit directly on the server, which is dangerous. You got to be careful there. We have our development servers all online. So again, Doing local development doesn't work well for me because if Ashley needs to get to it or whatever, you know, one of us out of town, it's all just, you know, whatever website dot dev, you know, we'll have set up here. This will let us just access it directly and edit files right on it, which is very convenient. Um, and again, because it's web-based, we all use one login. Uh, so if Ashley adds someone to it, I log in next time that client's in there too, and I can hop in and change whatever I need and get things done. Uh, it has version control and does some other neat things in there. It's 20 bucks a month or something. I don't, I haven't looked lately. It's, it's relatively cheap. I saw them years ago, um, and I was a little scared because you're putting in credentials into a system you don't know, but over the last few years they've raised $50 million in funding, and I mean, they've, they've grown up, they're pretty legit now. I feel pretty safe about recommending them, but certainly proceed at your own risk to some degree there. Um, but again, this is back to our philosophy of, I can't do anything here if I'm not online, so I make sure to the extent possible I'm always online. Um, and that's how we do that. For those of you that like to work offline or other things, PHP Storm, is the most popular IDE. It's one you can download for Windows or Mac and edit stuff on there. Um, Jetbrains.com slash PHPStorm. Other ones similar. So I know a lot of folks still use Dreamweaver because it is for just editing stuff. It's really still pretty easy. Sublime. There's a lot of, a lot of text editors out there. Code Anywhere is the one we like, but um, again, whatever works for your workflow. Uh, Manage WP, we switched to recently, and I love them so much. I can't even express it. Um, for those of you who have used their new Orion beta that's just about to go out of beta and become their official thing, it is amazing. Um, we used Infinite WP for a while. Uh, I guess I should back up. This is a tool for if you manage a bunch of WordPress sites at once. I'd say more than two or three. We have 141 in there, but it can handle any kind of size. Uh, Infinite WP is another one. iTheme Sync, you know, I, the Backup Buddy folks, they have one that's pretty good. WP Remote, Main WP, they're all pretty good. Uh, the big difference with Managed WP, particularly Orion, is their backups. We let our, our clients host wherever they want to host. We recommend where they should go. But we want it to be in their name and their control, which we'll recommend good hosts to them, but sometimes they pick less than good hosts. And if that's what they really want, we'll let them do it. Uh, Backup Buddy blows up on those kind of sites. iTheme Sync blows up on it. Infinite WP blows up on it. Orion doesn't. It works on every site, every time. I don't know how they do it, but um, I think the basic idea with them is Backup Buddy and others they kind of say, it's time for a backup. All right, ready? Go, 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 go. We have 30 seconds before it times out. Let's try to get it all in. Oh, it didn't make it. It crashed again. <laughs> Whereas Orion and others just kind of meander a little bit. They kind of go in and grab some files. It'll take a little while, but they'll back it all up slowly and not kill your site. Not unlike CodeGuard. If you just need backups, CodeGuard does a similar kind of thing where they'll FTP and kind of grab stuff and take their time and not, not hammer it. Whereas Backup Buddy and others, they only have, the server says there's a timeout limit. When you go, you better just go and they get it. Uh, the new Backup Buddy Live Stash, or Stash Live, I think is similar, but I've not played with it much yet. 
Um, but again, managed WP Orion is awesome. Pricing starts, if you just get one or two sites, it's like three bucks a month per site. When you scale up, we have 141 sites and it's like 88 cents per. So it's like 125 bucks for those. It's, the pricing is phenomenal. Though they're releasing their new pricing model tomorrow. So I'm a little <laughs> nervous about that. Because their pricing is still inherited. If you log in now, you still get to their old interface and this is their special beta one you can click to try out. Pretty soon, once they switch over, they're gonna have new pricing to go with it, which they promise will be fair and nice and we'll love it, but I'm still nervous, but we'll see. Um, I wouldn't tell them this, but I mean, if they tripled the price, I would still pay for it, because it, it is awesome. Um, but it does, you know, the backups are the main thing I like about it, but it does plug-in updates and core updates and uh, can do other cleanup stuff, cleaning revisions, can do some basic SEO things. I mean, it does a lot of neat stuff in there um, all in one place. You know, we're in there every day kind of massaging. It doesn't do it all automatically, because I want to see what's going on, and I know some plugins you've got to be careful about, but it certainly saves a ton of time, and it's quite awesome. So we'll see what tomorrow brings with the new pricing. Um, yeah, so that's that section. So SEO, the next one, search engine optimization, some tools we use there. Uh, Google Analytics, this would be a whole day session, I think, talking about this if we wanted to dive in, but I assume most all of you, if not all of you, use Google Analytics on your site because it's kind of the place you start for basic tracking stuff. Um, we cover, we do full meetups on this once a year or so just because it does take a lot of digging in, so that's all I'm going to say there. If you use it, go try it and um, we can all talk more about it in other sessions. <laughs> Uh, Raven Tools, this is kind of like Moz, kind of a search engine discovery research sort of tool. Uh, what we like about Raven is their pricing is pretty good. For 99 bucks a month, you can load as many sites into it as you want. And while it can connect to Google Analytics and those kind of things, it doesn't have to. I can pick any one of your sites and say, hey, let's plug it into Raven, and it'll go crawl your site and run some stuff without me having access to the site. Um, what that means for us is when someone calls and hey, we want to meet with you next week, we're thinking about redoing our site, I can right then plug in their existing site and get some numbers and have some nice reports to show. Whereas with other tools, you need to have access to it or add some tracking code or log into analytics or, you know, we do all that when we can, but for that initial run, we just drop it in there and go and get some neat stuff back out of it. It doesn't do everything I want, doesn't track um, individual rankings of keywords and stuff real well, but certainly does a lot. And again, we have, heck, we never take sites out, so we probably have 100 sites in there, you know, just why not leave them in there in case we need them again and have all the stats connected to that there. Uh, Moz, probably the most popular tool for this kind of thing. Uh, the difference there is 99 bucks a month gets you five sites, which is certainly fair. They have very powerful tools, nothing against them, but you know, it's just, I'd rather get more sites in there for less unless it's a deep, deep SEO thing we're working on. We do use them for certain clients that we need to get a lot more done on, uh, but not nearly as many. Uh, but it does rank, track rankings and stuff over time. A lot, of, a lot of different tools will do that, and they're, again, regarded as the best. Even if you don't want to pay for them, they have great blogs, great videos, great resources. Um, Open Site Explorer was mentioned yesterday. I think Jenny talked about that in the SEO thing for looking at backlinks to a site. That's free. You can use from them. Uh, their Whiteboard Friday video is awesome. So they're a great resource, even if you don't pay them. And then if you do pay them, they have great tools there, too. So um, that's pretty awesome. Moz Local is another one we use from them. Uh, Moz.com slash local. And this is for local SEO trying to get your NAP squared away, your name, address, and phone. It will look through dozens of different sites um, and tell you what's good and what's bad and what needs to be fixed. To some extent, it'll help fix them for you, but a lot of them say, hey, hey, you need to go fix your Facebook because it's bad. You know, they don't have access to it. Go fix it. They'll walk you through some of that, give you a score for it. Uh, the price for that is $84 per year per location. So for a one-off, that's not too bad, you know, six bucks a month or whatever. If you have 20 locations, though, each one's a separate fee and it can add up a little bit, but it does a great job of walking you through that. And there are there are other tools for that that I'm totally blanking on right now, but that's the one, the one we use there. Uh, does a nice job. Positionally is more similar to Moz, another one for tracking rankings. Uh, ClickHost has a nice page and probably an affiliate link, so I'll throw them out there. ClickHost.com slash Positionally, where they've written about it. I think Emery wrote a nice post about how it works and how he uses it there. Um, but very, again, similar to Moz, where it's more for tracking rankings and simple things there. Uh, the difference is where Moz is 99 bucks a month for five sites, these guys are 15 a month for 10 and pricing kind of goes up from there. So you can throw a lot more sites in it and track more if all you need is the tracking. Again, Moz goes deeper and better, but this does a very nice job for a very good price. Um, so that works out well there. Uh, moving on to our last category, business stuff, other business tools we use. We play with these as much as we play with task management stuff. Uh, the first one that we haven't played with in a while, Google Calendar. Anybody, hands for Google Calendar? Wow, more than I thought, so almost everybody. Love Google Calendar, that's a typical week for mine with um, all the different calendars thrown in. I mean, that's my personal one, my business one, Allie's personal one, her business one, um, my wife's calendar, our daughter's calendars. It's kind of nice to toggle things on and off. Um, I won't get into it too much. You already use Google Calendar. It's great. 
Um, but I do love, love how that works. Related to that, though, is one we started using earlier this year, late last year, called a pointlet. And so the challenge a lot of you have had is figuring out, hey, we need to meet. When, when are you free next week? Well, I'm free on Tuesday. Well, how about, are you free there? I'm like, oh, I already promised so-and-so. Maybe they can get that time. You know, we have an issue where we say, okay, you know, we need to meet with a client next week. Thursday's probably open. But, oh, no, I told someone else we had Tuesday and Thursday, so we've got to hear back from them first, and then we can see if Thursday's really open or not. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Um, and this does a good job of, of alleviating that. What this does is you set up, you say, here's the times I'm available in general. 9.30, I have 9.30 to 5. I want to have a little bit for myself. 9.35, Monday through Friday. And then look at my two calendars and Allie's two calendars and eliminate all those times and leave us an hour on either side. Here's what's left. So now we know we're open at these times. So we say, hey, client, here's, here's when we're open. Click on one you want. And as soon as they click on it and say their name, it reserves it on our calendar temporarily. And then we can get back with them and approve it's good or bad or otherwise. Um, it does go further. You can set up different time blocks. Here's a half hour meeting. Here's an hour meeting. Here's just Mickey, whatever, but I don't want to get into all that. So it's just me, me and Allie together for an hour. Here's when we're available. It works out great. Yeah. Yeah, with Google Calendar. Yeah. And it syncs instantly. Like if I go on and say, oh man, we have that whole day Monday open. I bet I want Monday morning more free for something else. I'll go into Google Calendar, just call, make one say, hey, keep this free, make the appointment. And it says, oh, they're busy then with something called keep it free or work or whatever. Like 15 bucks a month, something like that. I don't remember for sure, but it's, yeah, under 20 a month for it. It's, you know, maybe 10. I don't quite remember. I probably should have had more prices handy there, but, um, but it works out great for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, so our CRM stuff, so we're looking for, you know, to manage customer lists and, you know, where things are in a sales process and all that. Um, we've actually switched out of ProsperWorks now into uh, more of a full marketing automation suite. But ProsperWorks is awesome if you just need a good CRM to see, here's all my customers, here the, here's where they're in the buying cycle, here's their phone numbers, here's how they're connected to companies, all that kind of stuff. Um, a big thing this had that we lost in our new system, but I loved it here, was loss reasons. It's nice to go back and say, of the deals we had in the system last year that we lost, why did we lose them? What was the big thing? And so for us, it was lack of features was a big one, but it was really just one big client that we didn't get because we couldn't do apps at the time. Um, but we can still look and see, okay, we lost a lot because we were too expensive. We lost some, we don't know why, some to competitors, some that we declined, we didn't want to work with them. You know, it's kind of nice to be able to go back and see that and then click and say, all right, what were those jobs? Do we need to change things? Do we need to offer more features? Do we need to lower our prices? Do we need to do something different? Um, so prosperworks.com, it's between 19 and 119 a month per person. So we were, I think, on a middle plane. We were like 70 bucks a month for Allie and I both. So it was 150 bucks a month. But it really was quite good. Um, they're good folks. Just didn't do quite enough. We're trying to consolidate more things, and so got out of there. But um, I certainly highly recommend them. Related to that is one called PySync. Looking for a way to sync a lot of different things together. I, have, I use my Green Melon Google account a lot, and my personal account a lot syncs to my phone. And I might add one to one, but they're not in the other. So this will sync your Google accounts together. But what it also did, so it would sync my gmail.com account with my Google Apps account, and also sync my Google Apps into ProsperWorks. So that way, if I added any new client to ProsperWorks, as it sunk through, it'd be on my phone. Um, so my philosophy is quickly becoming, if someone calls, even if it's local, I don't know the number, I don't answer, because I've got to know the number. I've got 2,500 people in there, because everyone I've ever talked to is in my phone, because it all syncs through, which makes it nice, because most of the time, those local calls are people that have a local number, and they're their official Google representative trying to scam you for out of something. <laughs> so um, it works out well. So PySync, I think it's 15 bucks a month. And this is where Allie starts to get upset with me, because these are all cheap, but we have a lot of them. <laughs> they do add up, so you have to kind of pick and choose your battles. Um, and this one's kind of tough now, because we don't use ProsperWorks. I just have it for syncing my two, and so I need it for that. i, I got to think through that a little more. But it's very slick, does a good job, has dozens of integrations. They just added um, HubSpot integration last week. You know, they integrate with lots of so your hubs. If you use HubSpot's free CRM, you can have it synced to your Google, or have your HubSpot synced to your ProsperWorks, or, you know, sync a lot of things around different ways. does a good job with it. Um, another one like that is called Full Contact, fullcontact.com, very similar, does a nice job. The one thing Full Contact does better is you actually see your contacts on their site. With PySync, it's doing the work behind the scenes, but you don't see your contacts here. It's just doing it for you and making it happen. Full Contact says, here's all your contacts, and oh, by the way, we're syncing all these out to these places. You can edit them there if you want. So it was, it was kind of neat, but it seemed a little buggy to me, perhaps. I'm not sure. I have, again, I throw a lot of contacts in it, so it could just be I had bad data. I'm not sure, but this worked, worked pretty well. Uh, Contactually is another business one we no longer use, but I wanted to mention because it is great for what it does. Um, this is great for helping you remember to follow up with people based on when you followed up with them last. So 
You have to go through all your contacts and put them in buckets, which took me days to do years ago when I got it. To say, okay, this person is a client, this person is a lead, this person is a friend, this person is kind of a distant friend, this one's family. <laughs> you know, you set up like six buckets and say, okay, for my friends, make sure I've talked to them in the last three months. For my leads, make sure I've talked to them in the last two weeks. You know, you can set up different things and every morning you'll say, hey, here's what we're thinking you need to reach out to again. This, this guy's a lead, you haven't emailed him in two weeks. Like, oh yeah, they have gone silent. Let me get back out to him again. Um, and it connects with your email, so it pulls in your, your email from both accounts. You can log phone calls with it. There's others that do more with actually connecting in, uh, there was one, I can't remember the name of it now, that actually you connect to your Verizon or AT&T account and pull in your call logs there and match them up to contacts and do some things, but it was kind of buggy in other ways, so that didn't work out. But it's just nice. It knows theoretically when you've last talked to them and say, hey, you really should reach out to this person again. They're a lead. It's been two weeks. They've gone quiet. You know, we try to keep up with that on our own in Asana and in different things. You know, when we send out a proposal, we put a little task like follow up in a week. We haven't heard back, but it gets busy. We don't always do that, and this kind of would catch us if we didn't. Um, again, not using it now because it's really meant as a full CRM, and it was hard to have that and ProsperWorks and, it was just, and Google, and it just got to be too much. But if you don't have one, that could be a good way to go there. Another one that's right in that <laughs> 15, 20 bucks, yeah. Yeah, it was. It may have been a little more. I think maybe it was like 30, 35, but it was reasonable. But again, it's just it's a lot of those little things add up to be quite a lot. Uh, FreshBooks, we've used this for invoicing for years and years and love it. Um, it works very well. There's a couple things we like. One, clients can pay via PayPal or Stripe, which they can on most invoicing systems now. Really, the features we loved about this are kind of in Harvest and in Zero and some of the others now. Uh, we're here mostly because it still works for us and we have years and years worth of data in it. Not that it's necessarily the best, but uh, works very well. One thing I like that the others hadn't had for a long time is to see when a client viewed an invoice. So we can send an invoice out and see if they looked at it and they looked at it again two days later and like, okay, do we need to bug them? We know they saw it. Or we send an invoice out, it's been three weeks, well they never even looked at it. Maybe we went through their spam, you know, maybe we can call them to reach out. You can respond a little bit different because you know if they've seen the invoice or not, which is kind of nice. We're, we're considering a more full accounting system. We have an accountant that does it. Um, but the issue here is we can't get real deep and say, hey, how much did we spend on this project or pay this contractor? You know, I think it can do that. I haven't gotten into it too much. I was talking with Dave Cohen this morning trying to figure that out. He spoke last year about these kind of systems. Uh, but it does a good job for what we need. And it's um, 35 bucks a month. Or again, somewhere in that, <laughs> in that same thing per, per user. So we pay, you know, it's double that if we have different people in it. Uh, you can log in with the same account, but then you don't know who actually sent what and see what's going on there. Works well. Yeah. I'm not sure if you answered my question or not, but did you say you can, if, if, it, you see, if it tells you an invoice has been viewed, mm -hmm. no action has been taken, can you like, have like, an automated sequence like, at a certain date when we send them out? Not based on viewed or not. You, you can based on whether it's been paid or not. So after 30 days, it'll, after 20 days, I think it sends a, a reminder, and after 30 days, it says, hey, you're late, there's a 2% late fee. It can automate those out per client, which is nice. We have some clients, we know they pay late, but they're consistent, so we don't want to be bugging them. So we turn that off, but not based on viewing, which would be kind of cool. I don't think it does. You know, it, perhaps it does. I don't. You know, it's a deep system, but um, yeah. And then the last one, kind of a weird, weird program. I'll talk about for a minute. I have three minutes left, so this should work. Called Anki. I discovered this late last year. AnkiSRS.net, and I have a post about it. GM, or actually, a link to the article I read that got me interested. GMN2 Anki article. Um, so this is. I was always jealous of Kathy Drewing because she was so good at remembering people's names, and I'm bad at remembering people's names. And I discovered after watching it, she's not good at it. She just works at it. She'll go through it at her meetups. You'll see her just kind of before it starts, kind of go back, kind of hand, like with a little finger, just like this, all the way through. She said, wait a sec, what's your name again? Oh, yeah. And she works hard at it. And so this helps me work hard, among other things, with people's names. Um, there was a guy named Peter Wozniak 30 years ago that did some research uh, called Super Memo. There's an app today, but it's fallen into disregard. Uh, but it's basically flashcard learning but spaced repetition. He discovered the best time to re-remember re something is right before you forget it. But you don't know when you're going to forget it. So um, it's like anti-lock brakes. You know, the, they work best right before you start to skid, and so they do that for you. And so this, in theory, re reminds you of something right before it thinks you were going to forget it. Um, and it, the way it works is kind of neat. So if I add, again, I use people as an example. It's one of my decks I have in there. I put someone in there, and it's, okay, Tom Wynn. Okay, I got Tom Wynn. Tomorrow it shows up again. Tom Wynn, yep, I got it. I knew that. Okay, the next day it shows up again. Yep, I got it right. So then it puts them out like a week. And so a week goes by. Yeah, that's Tom. And so, okay, great. Now it's three weeks. And so over time it spreads out. You know, someone like Tom, it, I, I think he's in there. I put, put most everyone in there. He's probably like at six months. Now. I know Tom, you know. So every six months it'll bubble up and it's like, oh, crap, what is his name? I don't remember. It resets it for you. Um, the idea being if it's 2,000 cards, you only have to do like 11 a day once it starts spreading them out. It's not a big deal. You can do a lot of neat things. 
Uh, but faces are one. Geography, I'm horrible at geography. I don't know where countries are, and I feel dumb about that. So people have sets of cards you can download and put in. So I have a geography one I put in. I look at a couple cards a day. Do I remember that one still? No, I forgot it. You can kind of work through. So 20 minutes a day, and I know lots of people's names and lots of countries and other things. It's kind of cool. Um, desktop version is free. Android version is free. The iOS version is 25 bucks. So <laughs> Apple people have more money, I guess. I think it's because they had to develop it separate due to the, I don't know. But yeah, Lisa. Ah, uh, good point. Yeah, I should have put that in. We use, uh, if you use Teamwork Desk, it has time tracking stuff built in. Asana does not, so we use one called Toggle without an E at the end, T-O-G-G-L. Does a good job. Tom, do you have? There you go, yeah. It, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, they, to put in their own, yes. Time tracking versus time sheets. There's a couple different questions. Yeah. Yeah, Harvest has good time tracking built in, yeah. Paymo. Paymo? Okay, cool. Yeah, Harvest we've considered moving to. The one thing I don't like, Harvest can't pull in your bank account stuff and try to do a spe expenses against it, but it does have some very solid stuff otherwise, yeah. Uh, I think you mentioned most of the marketing automation. Um, what is it? We, we're using what's called SharpSpring. A lot like HubSpot, but ma made for agencies where their pricing model is a little different. A little rough around the edges compared to some of the others, but really very powerful. But yeah, working well so far. I yeah, hadn't had a chance to get that in. Do you use anything like an editorial calendar? Google Spreadsheets usually. Yeah, yeah just because it's easy for everyone to hop in and put their stuff and paste links in. And yeah, we've played with, anyone have better thoughts for editorial calendars? Co-schedule. Co-schedule? Okay, yeah, I have seen that one. I don't remember why we don't use it. Maybe I just hadn't looked at it <laughs> enough. So um, yeah, it looked good. But to thank you for a sec real quick, just to show you a bit more on it. Um, just a quick example. So this is how it looks when you pull up a card. So anyone know what country that is? <laughs> See, so we all need it. Yay. Who, who, Ghana, there we go. So you pull up this card, it says, hey, what country is this? The first time you don't know, it doesn't show you the answer. You say, all right, show me the answer. And say, okay, it's Ghana. And how'd you do? You need to do it again. It'll show it to you again in a few minutes till you get it at least once. You got it right? Cool. I've gotten it right a few times. So if I say it was hard, but I got it 16 days from now, now I got it pretty good, a month and a half. Now that was easy, so it's almost two months. And so you tell it how you do on cards. So I know Ghana now, it was easy, so it won't show up again for a month and a half when I'm probably about to forget it again. And again, in theory, it works pretty well to keep that going. So ankysrs.net for that. Um, and their website has a lot of the card decks for things like Bible stuff and math stuff and science terms and geography and all that built in. And then if you want to use, again, my main goal is faces because. I'm bad at it compared to Kathy, who practices her own way, so now I can practice my own way too. Um, yeah, and there we go. So right on time. Any other questions?